Hey there, I'm back to interrupt your regularly scheduled entertainment. Do you like my thumbnail? Or that opening bit? As you can imagine, we're going to be talking about Pokemon. Well, collectibles. Uh, well, specifically collectible cards. Pokemon is pretty fun as a concept in the games. I think the different little Pokemon are just really adorable. I particularly like Rockruff and Mars Shadow, just peak character design right there. The plots to a lot of the games are also pretty good. I like to argue that the shows and movies also are fairly decent and entertaining to watch. Uh, even if some people had some choice words to say about some animation styles being changed. Pokemon Go was also really entertaining for a while until the game just blatantly stopped giving me Pokeballs and I really couldn't do anything else because I didn't want to spend money on the game. Then we get to the card game and people lose their absolute marvels about it. Not too long ago there's been a surge of fairly popular YouTubers buying expensive cards, card packs, and entire boxes just to open for a video. Uh, most of these videos are from people who know about, understand, and appreciate Pokemon, but naturally there's some people who just recognize the material value of collectibles and that's how we stumbled upon the disastrous live stream from Dumb Money trying to buy a box of first edition cards and getting scammed. Jarvis Johnson did a hilariously wonderful video covering the ordeal. I'll link his video in the description box to check out. Uh, he's a lot more charismatic than I am, so I highly encourage you to do so. Uh, so why do people lose their minds about Pokemon cards? Why do people collect cards in general? Let's look at a bit of history stuff, shall we? Because I'm nothing if not educational. Pokemon cards have been around for a while now. The first release of the TCG happened in 1996 in Japan and 1999 in the United States. These cards were called the base set and included 102 unique cards. Today there's a little over 9,000 different cards to collect and yet people complain about completing a Pokedex. Now like anything that promotes trading, it also invokes an urge in people to collect. And what better thing to collect than cards made from a franchise where the tagline is, gotta catch them all. Card collecting isn't anything new. Even before Pokemon, there was trading cards for, well, a wide variety of things. You had cards specific to games, like Magic the Gathering, and then you could dive into trading cards not completely used for games at all, like cigarette cards. Some of the first trading cards in modern history came around in the 1860s by a sports company called Peck and Snyder. This original set included only 10 cards, each featuring members of the baseball club in Cincinnati called the Red Stocking. Soon enough, around 1876, cigarette companies also had the thought to put cards in their products as well and went into designing and producing them. Originally, packing cards in the cigarette packs were left blank and only really served as a means to keep the product stiff enough so the contents of the box wouldn't be crushed. And so in the 1880s, cigarette companies began to include promotional art with their products, collectibles to encourage brand loyalty. While baseball was a fairly popular subject for most of these companies, many also included cards of actors, war heroes, places, and even Native American leaders. These cards often also included information on them in regards to the images displayed, such as a baseball player's statistics. These cards, since they were relatively cheap to obtain, ended up being called the Working Man's Encyclopedia, and in many impoverished communities, these cards actually tended to serve as educational material for young children in regards to famous celebrities in distant, faraway places. Cigarette cards were rapidly gaining popularity among the youth at the time due to this, even when a paper shortage caused production of them to temporarily stop. However, even in the 1880s, many states in the US started to push to limit the access minors had to tobacco. There was a lot of push and shove for these limitations due to the before mentioned popularity these cards held with children. And so by the 1900s, companies started to expand to put cards within more kid friendly products. In the 1930s, the Fleer Company and the Goody Gum Company began to put baseball cards in their packaging. And while Goody Gum did not see success in this endeavor, the Fleer Company did, with Fleer branching away from candies in order to become a card company. By the 1950s, major card companies also tried to follow this trend of including cards with candy. Tops tried to switch things up and use taffy instead of gum, only to be led with disastrous results, like the taffy pulling the ink from the cards and becoming absolutely disgusting in the process. Naturally, they switched back to the gum game like everybody else. Tops was also one of the first companies to introduce the concept of a trading card game. Their cards could be used to play 
a baseball game. Yes, creative titling, I know. And which people with these cards can use them to simulate a baseball game. Originally, these playing cards only came in two different sets, 52, the red set and the black set, but later would expand to 407 different cards. While getting these cards were considered collectible in nature due to each pack of gum having a random card, the game that you could play with these cards did not involve any strategy at all. Many early trading card games were among the same vein, mostly a solitaire game in which players weren't actually competing with one another and it was just up to chance who scored the highest. By the 1990s, card collecting picked up more among an adult audience, and companies were met with complaints in regards to the gum, since it had the potential to stain and cause damage to the cards. This naturally led to some cards being sold on their own or in packs. Around the time that gum was starting to be phased out of the baseball card scene, Wizards of the Coast was founded, and had the idea of combining the strategic playstyle of Dungeons and Dragons with collectible cards, and thus, after trial and error, in 1993, Magic the Gathering was born as the first modern strategic trading card game. With the success of this game, naturally launched many other trading card games many of which were owned or even licensed by Wizards of the Coast, including the original English edition of Pokemon. Pokemon ended up becoming the first trading card game that ended up outselling Magic the Gathering, and that garnered the attention of Hasbro, who then bought Wizards of the Coast. By 2003, Nintendo revoked the rights of Pokemon from Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast, and instead gave the rights to the Pokemon Company International, which was first just known as Pokemon USA. And now here we are, buying and selling and repackaging Pokemon cards. It should all be fun and games from here, but there's obviously some problems in the game of collectibles. The value of collectibles, especially things still being actively produced, is dependent on the location and how hard it is to obtain the product. So in terms of location where I live, not a ton of people give a shit about Nintendo products in general. So when there was a shortage of Amiibos and Pokemon cards, that never like super, super affected my area in general, which isn't to say that they just didn't sell out at all. It's just they didn't sell out nearly as quickly as other places. However, where some of my friends live 14 to 17 hours away from me, they reported never having Amiibos or Pokemon cards in stock at any store after a major release ever. And in terms of how hard something is to obtain, I generally mean the statistical chance of pulling a particular card. Naturally, some cards are going to be harder to find, even if you are just spending the retailed value amount on card packs to get it. This also ties into region-specific variations on cards, both in rarity of the card pull as well as location. While a card here in the US could go for like $3, it could be worth hundreds in an overseas market because collectors are willing to pay that extra amount for different artwork or specialty finishes like holographics. Same thing with like a card from Japan coming here. For a lot of collectors, the actual usability of the card in question isn't really relevant. It's just a matter of being able to say and show that you have this hard to obtain object. Price gouging is also a big issue in the collectibles community because it's become a frustratingly common practice for people with money to just buy everything in bulk so no one else can have it and then reselling it for a super inflated price point. Like the guy who bought like every single Princess Peach amiibo he could and was reselling them for hundreds of dollars a piece while like the Walmart price was $15 or something. Or the fact that my friend still screams about wanting Pokemon Hidden Fate set but it was inflated to nearly $200 from its original retail price of 50. And if people know that they can make money from something, even in the shitty, shady practice of price gouging, people are just going to do it. And worse yet, if people assume that they can get away with it, they're going to scam people using these hyperinflated prices, which is what ended up happening to dumb money, in which the first edition card box they tried to purchase had already been opened and the contents tampered with. With the box itself seemingly to be in decent shape given the alleged age, once the box was opened, it was apparent that the cards inside were definitely not from the original box. They ended up not going through with their transaction once they realized they'd been duped. But the Pokemon community who had been watching this take place during a live stream, they all seemed to know that this type of situation was going to happen. Which brings me to state that these people who are getting into buying collectible cards for the sake of them being worth a lot of money probably should research more beforehand who they're dealing with before making a huge deal out of exchanges like this. This ties into the con man will scam someone just because they think they can get away with it. Dumb Money knew nothing about Pokemon or the community centered around collecting the cards, and so whoever the dealer was felt that they can get away with overselling a bogus box. 
I'm in the same vein of trying not to like outright accuse that guru dude because like I don't want someone to sue me in case this video is seen by someone but like still everybody knew that something was fishy <laughs> but honestly the entire concept of bulk buying collectibles to resell them at exuberantly inflated price points uh, in order to make a profit itself is just fishy. I'm too poor to see the value of these kind of investments. It's one thing to buy a particular card if you want it just because you're collecting the cards, but I feel that it's a touch unhealthy to be spending hundreds and thousands of dollars on packs of cards to open, hoping you'll get something decent. This is like gambling. <laughs> For kids. No, but seriously. There's been some discussion in terms of if these kinds of blind card packs and boxes should be considered a form of gambling, and if it is, if it should be regulated in the same fashion as things like the lottery and casinos are. Belgium had already deemed loot boxes and video games to be in violation of their gambling laws, but are they so different compared to card packs? Is it the nature of things being digital versus physical that makes the difference and why there hasn't been a bigger coverage in terms of regulating collectible cards? In 2019, the U.S. also began to attempt proposing a bill to ban loot boxes, especially ones in games targeted towards minors, but the bill has only just been proposed. There hasn't been any follow-up as of, you know, making this video. Although, since the discussion of loot boxes fostering addictive practices in minors, there has been updated terms in regards to how social media platforms were able to collect data from children, but collectible cards aren't collecting data from anyone on their own. So how would one regulate the sale and distribution of them in a manner that wouldn't hurt the industry? I'm not an economist, so discuss in the comments if you think collectible cards are fostering gambling addictions and if they should be regulated. Is the recent surge of Pokemon card videos on YouTube from people not a part of the Pokemon community also fostering these gambling practices since many of them are purchasing these cards under the assumption that they can make a profit? Or does it even matter since bulk buying practices from resellers are making it very difficult for an average consumer to purchase these card packs? Which, to clarify, I know that not all the people buying these cards to resell them are doing it for themselves. Some of them are doing it for charity and like, good for them, but hey, just because it's not a profit for you doesn't mean that there wasn't a profit being made. And hey, if you don't have like an opinion on regulations on card packs or any sort of regulation on like the price gouging that resellers are doing, why don't you just tell me your favorite Pokemon card? <laughs> this video is brought to you by Patreon. Thanks so much to Ted Riaz and Brigid Bree for subscribing. If you want to support me in making new content from videos like this to comics and illustrations, consider checking me out on Patreon. Tiers start as little as $1 a month. Did you like the art footage used in the background for this video? If you're interested in watching me work on illustrations like this, consider checking me out on my Twitch channel where I draw, chat, and play games. Remember to like this video if you learned something, subscribe to my channel for more videos like this, and to ring the bell if you just want to be notified for whenever I post. Thanks so much for watching. This is Minji, signing off. Until next time.